Good morning and um, welcome back to those of you that were here last week and welcome to the, the newcomers as well. Uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I know my internet connection was just flagging itself as being a bit unstable there so just somebody shout if, I, if I'm freezing or something like that. Um, but I have to do an emergency dash to sit outside the hub in my car and do the rest of the workshop from there. So um, last week we got through a good bit, but not all of it. Um, so much in this that I could almost take a half day or a day doing how much I kind of have prepared for it. Um, but the thing about the online workshop is that we can't actually do the activity exercises that we would be doing in a group in real life. So hopefully we'll, we'll get through today a good bit more. Um, just want to flag that I think um, Maggie and the Hub want to record these workshops, so we are going to be recording this one. I had asked last week not to record it because I did want to engage you guys as much as possible and to get you doing stuff with me where we could. So um, I think we're going to record today, but if there's any kind of participatory stuff going on, I think they'll be stopping the recording or editing it out before we kind of disseminate it if anyone's asking for it or looking for the recording. But also it'll be available if you, any of you want it as well. Um, the other thing then is that I will be sending out the slides later. Uh, I am working on putting them together into more of a kind of a booklet with some extra information because as you'll see I'm a very kind of the best way to do a presentation is with as little on the slides as possible kind of person and that it, that is what you should be doing so my slides might not be that useful because they're quite, uh, quite uh, low in word kind <laughs> so um, the other thing I was going to suggest, I did suggest if any of you were on the working from home webinar we did last week is that if you go into your settings on Zoom there, I think there's like a, I don't know, everyone sees Zoom differently. So what I see isn't what you're seeing right now, but there is three dots that say more on your control panel. And if you go into that, when I start sharing my slides with you, you can pick a side by side view and that will give you basically the slides and me and you won't get distracted by anyone else and looking at yourself like I do and you'll just it's a, it's a good way to do a webinar because I've done webinars I found it like very useful to see the slides on the speaker and kind of make the speaker kind of box bigger so you can kind of see their face and their expressions and stuff it tends to work well um so I think that's all the the housekeeping out of the way um hopefully this uh, my voice is going to hold up today because it was wrecked last week, but I actually last week did a full vocal warm up like actors vocal warm up before the webinar and my voice was fried after it because sitting down is actually quite difficult to breathe and project well, but I've very much operate on a do as I say not as I do basis because today I'm after drinking coffee with loads of milk in it just before coming on. So that's the absolute worst thing to do before you're public speaking because my heart is now pounding from palpitations from all the caffeine and my vocal cords are coated in milk, which is the worst for your voice. So great start for me anyway today. So I'm gonna slide share now with you and I think we're just gonna try and find where we were last week and pick up from there. So I'm sorry for everyone who's missed up until this point, but we're gonna pick up, I think we were around were we here? I think. Does anyone remember from last week what we'd got to? I think it was around here. Maggie? Yeah, I think I, I did see Marilyn. Is she in the next slide? Marilyn? Oh, um, I think it's someone else. Oh. Not, but no. This okay. is okay. No, I so, see that one before. Right, all the slides have kind of decided to go out of this is what we were talking about. So I think what we had finished on last week was this one, which was about looking directly at who you're talking to. So this was an example of someone giving someone side eye and how that can make you look a bit kind of suspicious of someone. So you can see Sabeel around there giving like complete side eye to, I can't remember that actress's name. But anyway, the point was that if you're kind of like say, I have my nose pointed over there and I'm kind of talking to you like this, you might think it just, it's not as direct as looking at someone straight in the face. So the idea was that you would stand where you're standing in a room and when you're talking, you're looking, if you're, especially if you're answering a question or it's to one person you're talking that you're looking directly at them as opposed to giving them a bit of side eye because it can look a bit suspicious or can look skeptical or cynical. So wherever you are looking, are talking you should be looking straight at them and the point that we had made earlier which we kind of ran through sorry I think my internet connection is going as well now um, 
Are we back? Okay. Thumbs up. Yeah. Cool. Um, is that when you're turning your head, you should just say if I'm talking to someone over here, I should just turn my head like that as opposed to turning my whole body like that. Because if you are kind of speaking on a stage or in front of a big group of people, it just kind of turns you away from everyone. And also if you kind of, you could trip, you're looking down at your feet, if you're moving, all of those things. So the idea is that you're like a tripod, you're standing really tall and firm, and then you just swivel your head to where you're talking to. So we'll go from there. Um, also, I think this is just a really important one to pick up on, because I do think, especially now that we're all doing Zoom conferences and meetings and things like that, that if you're in a meeting and you're listening to someone, you might be like this, and that is what I would call the looking at a really confusing painting kind of head pose, because you're trying to figure something out and you're listening and you're receptive. But a lot of people will then start talking and saying their bit in that pose, whereas you just kind of look like you don't really know what you're talking about if you do that. So put your head up straight again before <clears throat> you actually start saying your bit and point your notes directly at who you're talking to. Then there's a lot of things you can do with your voice, which I think we really did skip over for time last week. Um, and we discussed earlier last week, we talked about the diaphragm and how you can do diaphragmatic breathing. And actually I was talking to a friend of mine at the weekend who said she is really struggling with Zoom calls and she lives in an open plan apartment and her boyfriend said, your voice is just shaking when you're on Zoom meetings. You're literally like, ah. And she was asking me for some tips on how to kind of calm down for that. And I think one is like, get your boyfriend out of the room because I would hate someone to be listening to me when I'm in a meeting, <laughs> but uh, there's <laughs> nowhere else for him to go. So um, then we were talking about that candle thing we were talking about last week, which was putting your, your finger out in front of you and blowing as if you're blowing really gently around a flame. So that's to calm you down and also to control your breathing. And what came out of our conversation was that she always thought that breathing should be like that really deep breathing into your belly but we figured out that she needs to actually just breathe into her diaphragm so it's more like that pilates breathing where you are kind of pushing your ribs up and out as opposed to puffing out your belly so the breathing is something i'd really really focus on it's kind of the key that all of this centers around centers on even and to be pedantic and getting that breathing under control and practicing diaphragmatic breathing and um you can actually feel it right under your rib, ribs there. So for those of you that weren't here last week, I just, that is something that is really important is to breathe into your diaphragm, not into your collarbone, not into your belly, right into your diaphragm so that your diaphragm is going from like this frowny shape to this shape when all the air goes in and then it pushes that air up out of your lungs. Um, and my friend was struggling to find her diaphragm because she's pregnant, but <laughs> she, she's, uh, she's definitely got a lot of breathing work to do now. So other things that you would work on if you want to work on your voice projection is forward tone. So forward tone is really about pushing your voice out of your mouth. And <clears throat> I think a lot of Irish people, you know, that kind of real closed mouth, Irish kind of accent kind of thing. That's really bad. Obviously, you want to open up your mouth. So any kind of vocal warm ups would do that. And one of the huge parts of the one that I would teach in a workshop, which just isn't going to work online, um, is that your tongue is actually quite lazy. So your tongue likes to just like slide back and chill out in the back of your throat. But actually, what a lot of the vocal warm ups that involve a lot of sticking your tongue out and talking with your tongue out would do is to get your tongue moving forward to get that forward tone. And if you think about, say, like French people, when they speak, it's always like very kind of trumpet shaped kind of pouty lips that they use. And a lot of the words, but there's that kind of ooh shape. So that also helps with forward tone, whereas different languages actually make your mouth work different ways to get the sounds out. And some languages are better for that than others. So unfortunately for us, forward tone is something we really have to like do all the vocal exercises, do all that like um, um, uh, stuff before you warm up your voice and that can help with that forward tone. Uh, pacing is something is again like don't do what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to brush through all the slides, um, barrel through them at like record speed. So your pacing is hugely important in terms of meaning, pause and one thing I come back to again and again is if you are trying to do something that is really impactful it's really important to slow it down 
<clears throat> I think my internet connection might be giving me calls to pause again there. That's okay. Um, yeah, so impressive pauses kind of give people like this feeling of this is really important and you're an important enough person to waste their time by saying nothing for a second and they still have to sit there listening to you, which is kind of essentially how it works in a, a psychological way. It gives that feeling of power. It's like, I'm taking up so much space. I'm not even saying anything and you're still listening. But a great example of this is if you want to Google someone and watch a bit on YouTube is any speech Barack Obama makes. He pauses so much and you really notice it when you start listening to it. Um, and it makes him sound really powerful and important and like what he has to say is worth listening to. But it also, if you're giving a speech about anything or a presentation about something quite technical, gives people a chance to take it in because there's so much going on. So all of this that I'm telling you now, I should probably pause a bit more. But anyway, <laughs> we'll uh, keep going. Uh, resonance then is another thing that is more kind of physical. So back here in your throat where your vocal cords are, it's kind of how the air pushes through there and gives it a really round, rich kind of sound to your voice. Tone color is kind of similar to that. Pitch is high pitch, low pitch. And then inflection is kind of how you stress certain words. So obviously thinking about what you're saying beforehand and really putting emphasis on certain words might be important for certain things. And best way to kind of overemphasize that inflection then is to use your pauses around it. And then your diction is um, how clear you're speaking. So this is something that I learned when I was learning. I did languages in college and I did French. And the pen trick, I would say, <laughs> I used to do this in workshops and I was like, oh, that's disgusting, giving people pens. I don't want them back afterwards. Um, but you could use a straw, a chopstick, anything like that, and then just put it between your teeth and actually practice talking with that in your mouth. Because your diction will be super clear because all of your facial muscles have to work so much harder to make the sounds that it will really tone up kind of that, that mouth muscle and you should be much more clear afterwards. And so then on to more technique. I'm not gonna make you do the, the pen thing now. We would if we were in a workshop. Uh, so oratorical technique is kind of ancient kind of art of speaking. And there was a really famous speaker called Demosthenes or something in ancient Greece, who like hundreds and hundreds of years later his work was still being studied in ancient Rome so then the great speakers in ancient Rome used to recite his speeches and he used to do stuff like practice speaking with a mouthful of pebbles or go down to the beach and speak louder than the roar of a stormy sea to practice his projections so there are some things you could do locally if you wanted to uh, but things the oratorical technique is more about the kind of impressiveness of your speech so we're talking about using the pauses varying the intensity so you might go from kind of speaking quietly to getting really like rousing kind of loud stuff uh varying your pace so you know if you're talking about something quite new and exciting it might be a case that you would actually talk a bit quicker because it's kind of you're trying to get everyone jazzed up about it but then if you really want to kind of show your authority be very firm about something that would be the time to really slow it down uh, rhetorical questions would be questions that don't necessarily need answering, which is if you're talking to a crowd, that's a good way to at least engage them because once you ask a question, you all have to think about it, right? You might not necessarily be jumping up out of your seat to answer back, but it does bring you back into what the person's talking about and kind of bring you into kind of feeling more part of it. So then another thing then is repetition to reinforce significance. So that can be within the same sentence or going back to something later at the end of your, your discussion. So just later on kind of coming back to important points, but in a kind of a repetition in the same sentence, say maybe going over something one or two or three times just to make it really clear in people's heads can be very effective. So on to bad habits. And the reason I have a picture of, I can't even remember which Hemsworth here, <laughs> but it's um, because bad habits are distracting and that picture I'm finding very distracting as well. So that's, that's why he's there. <laughs> I can't stop looking at him now. I can't even look at the list of words. 
Um, so bad habits are filler words is a huge one. I think we all do these. Um, um, uh, like so, uh, they are one of the worst things in speech that like, we're all guilty of. And the kind of only way to really kind of practice them out of your speech is to record yourself, listen to yourself, watch it back over and try and weed them out. And there is a great app, which used to be free, but I'm not sure if it is anymore. And it's called Ori, it's O-R-A-I. And you could record yourself on it and it would give you scores and they would catch how many ums or ahs you'd said. You can also use it to record your, or kind of gauge the pace you're speaking at. So it will have a kind of a range of too slow, too fast and in the middle, and you can just talk into it as it records and it will show you a little graph of how fast you're talking. And it'll kind of give you little exercises to train you up. So if it's something you, you do want to practice on a regular basis, I'd highly recommend that. And I, I mean, it's probably worth, it's worth subscribing to, I've used it and I'm going to subscribe to it myself. But um, <clears throat> the last time I looked into my account on it, it, it does seem to be subscription only at the moment. So, uh, fidgeting is another one so using your hands is good obviously if you can relax into using them but if you are doing something like constantly like touching your earring or flicking your hair or playing with something you're wearing like at your zip or anything like that is distracting and anything that is as distracting as a Hemsworth picture on the side of a slide is gonna <laughs> distract people from actually listening to what you're talking about so the idea, the idea is that you just get yourself to a place of kind of solid stillness where you're still using gesture and expression, but you're not faffing. So pacing is another thing that people do on stage, especially if they're nervous. And everyone would kind of recommend don't pace up and down if you're given a presentation or something like that. But you can in certain circumstances. So I think stage one is get yourself still but fluid gesture, then you can start to kind of introduce movement where you are confident doing it. So one thing is in front of a crowd of people, don't walk up and down in case you might trip. If you don't look at the ground, you're more likely to trip. But if you do look at the ground, you're not looking at your audience and then you're losing your connection with the audience. And no one wants to listen to someone who is talking to the ground. So the kind of times that you would use maybe moving from one side to another is to show the passage of time. So it can be effective as a storytelling tool. If you're saying you're over here and you're like, well, on Monday I did this thing and then you walk across and you're like, and then on Wednesday this happened. So it does show this movement or last year, this year, last year, my business was blah, blah, blah. And this year we're doing this thing. So that kind of movement shows a different place, a different time kind of the the train of your thought or your the arc of your story but it's not really necessary um a lot of people would stay standing behind a lectern if there's any kind of lectern there that's not great if you can do get out from behind it because it's just more open to connect with your audience rather than and the temptation to lean on a lectern is really bad and you should be standing up straight on your own hind legs so I would say get out from behind the lectern, but don't walk up and down all the time. Um, <clears throat> freezing is a bad habit, obviously, and it's probably people's most biggest fear as well. But as we spoke about last week, I highly recommend not learning your lines. And we'll get on to the rehearsal element and how you can kind of work around that. But if you learn stuff off, there's a possibility that one wrong word or one wrong sentence in the wrong order will throw you completely. So you should know your subject matter really well, but don't have a script as such. Just have your keywords on your slides like this that remind you what you can talk about or have, you know, a little note thing, which I recommended this last week as well. So they're like those little cards that you can use, but this one has like a ring binder on it. So if you're really clumsy like I am, you can't drop them and pick them up in the wrong order because they're just all held together. <clears throat> now, Oh, these are the, two of my absolute bugbears then is the next two here is upward inflection and vocal fry. So upward inflection is um, how like every child under probably 15 is <laughs> speaking now. 
and it's that kind of American influenced is internet connection okay yeah um I keep getting little messages up on my screen saying my internet connection is bad so I'm just checking every time uh, so upward inflection is the American influenced kind of your voice goes up at the end of a statement so it sounds like you're questioning it so it's I mean like are we are we talking <laughs> or is this a statement but it sounds like a question and I've noticed my niece who's about 12 does it so much that my sister and myself started doing it to her to, <laughs> to tease her because we're really mean <laughs> and then the other one that is actually probably going to be the way we all speak in 20, 30, 40 years is vocal fry. I'll, I'll go on to that. I have a slide about it because it's so annoying. Um, the end, bad, other bad habits are asymmetric posture. So as we said, you know, you need to be shoulders back, head level, strong spine. Asymmetric posture is like a little bit off. Um, maybe leaning, or if you had a lectern, if you were leaning on it, so you're not fully straight up. And it's just that you're in a bit of a slouch. You're not straight up. So you don't look as poised or confident in that way and then bobbing head is like a bobbing head that you'd get in the back of a car and that's also like super distracting and especially if you have like i've long earrings on so if i'm bobbing my head and they were bigger earrings they'd be going constantly as well so just trying to keep your head quite still is is good vocal fry it's like thanks kardashians for this one so vocal fry and i don't know i can't i might not be able to do it now when i try to do it but it has all these different words for it and basically say i mean like 50 70 years ago you know people in england especially would have all had that kind of received bbc pronunciation and now nobody speaks like that so vocal I mean, people who study voice whatever they're called um you know they do say that the way people speak changes over time and yeah no one speaks with that sort of clipped bbc pronunciation anymore but then in 50 years are we all going to be speaking like the kardashians where they do this kind of thing where it just kind of ends like this, like, oh my God. And it's like, ah, uh, sound that is vocal fry. <laughs> it's like, it's Wednesday. <laughs> so doing that, it kind of doesn't, it closes your throat a bit when the air is coming over the vocal cords and it apparently can be quite damaging to your voice. So it's that kind of lazy, lazy ending to words and if you catch yourself doing it, I'd urge you to stop because it is it is damaging to your vocal cords. But according to some people, that might just be how we're all going to end up speaking in the future. So maybe you want to practice. I don't know. Uh, anyway, to properly use your voice, um, if you are doing something that's big and important and you want to feel confident about it, there, is, there are, I mean, you can probably look up some warm-ups and vocal warm-ups yourself to do. I'm not going to go through this one because actually learning it took a full hour to go through every bit myself and we don't we don't have that hour now so i would just recommend if you find some tongue twisters even or quick little things as just like swirling your tongue around in your mouth um do stretches any kind of stretches or yoga that you like yourself um and you can do it in the morning once you've done it you're done for the day it doesn't need to be right before you do the thing you know, maybe if it's an event at night time, you might leave it till a bit later in the afternoon to do it, but do like a full body stretch. It's not just about warming up your voice. It's about opening your chest out as well. So that these muscles often get really constricted from sitting, typing at desks and things like that. So do things that will really open out here, that will stretch along your sides. And, <clears throat> and yeah, so then loosen up your face muscles. So a bit of facial massage, all of these things, it's not just the voice, but then definitely do your tongue twisters, get the pen between the teeth and uh, any kind of like swirling your tongue around and then sticking your tongue out and trying to talk with your tongue out. I think that's the most concise summary of kind of what you need to do. And if we ever get to see each other in real life and do one of these actually in the hub, we'll, we'll do the full, the full thing. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, my slides all seem to have... Um, gone funny since last week. Um, gravitas is kind of basically cleaned out. So you want it to be very solid, very grounded, and then kind of 
have a powerful, strong voice and you're speaking slowly if you want to sound like everything you're talking about is very important. So you don't want to seem like you're shifty or kind of milling around the place. And you, as we said, you move kind of to a new idea or showing the passage of time, you can kind of move over a bit on the stage. Um, grounding vis visualization is another thing I would do in a workshop. And I learned this um, grounding vis visualization is amazing in a RADA workshop in London. And it's really strong to get you really feeling like rooted into the earth. And I think that does really on a very deep level improve your sense of confidence and your ability to kind of hold yourself quite well before you speak. So, I mean, it, it basically connects you into the earth. So one thing from it, I won't like, I'm not going to, I don't know if a meditation kind of thing would work quite well over Zoom now. But again, it's something if we ever get to do a workshop in real life, we'll definitely do this. It's brilliant. But I would say even for me here, what I would do to feel grounded is just go down to the beach, go barefoot into the water and stand there. And when the tide is coming out, it'll pull your heels down a bit into the sand. So even just doing that is a really nice way to kind of feel rooted. And what you're kind of feeling is essentially that all the energy from the earth is kind of connecting you to the earth, but also you're getting that energy like hot lava coming up from the center of the earth, making you feel really strong as well. Um, so highly recommend just kind of even standing and just feeling yourself root into the ground. And you know, if you ever have a, if you've ever gone to a yoga class where they're talking about really placing your foot, you know, like if your foot's normally like that on the ground, if you spread your toes out, like really spread them that you get a much firmer kind of standing on the ground. And then a huge thing, which I found from this workshop that I didn't even notice is that a lot of us lock our knees. And once you lock your knees, if anybody wants to stand up, I know someone said to me after last week that they actually wanted to stand up and do things along with me. So don't feel silly about standing up if you want to try this. I'm, I'm not going to, because then I'll go out of view, but, and I don't want to be fiddling around too much, but if any of you at home want to stand up, do. And just see how your knees are and do you kind of lock them out? And if you feel like they're locked out, feel like just do a little body scan and feel around the rest of your body. Does locking your knees make everything else feel a little bit more tense? So I think some of us, the tendency is when we stand up straight is to almost get too straight and lock out. But just see if you stand now um, and just soften your knees a bit, how that feels. Well done, Maggie, for getting up. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Come on, Eloise. Nice one. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you just lock out your knees, like really stand up straight and lock those knees, and then just soften them and kind of just sit down into it a bit, like with soft knees, how that affects the tension that you feel. And so if you lock them and then soften them, you should feel a lot just easier in yourself when you soften your knees and also more grounded. So get your toes all spread out, really flatten the feet on the ground, soften the knees, take a deep breath, and then you should feel so much better in your standing position than if those knees are all locked and the rest of you kind of automatically tenses up with it as well. So hopefully, can I get any reaction? Can I get a thumbs up if that worked for you, yeah? <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, oh, now my slides, where are you gone? So um, now some of the things we've talked about are ways to kind of start or to sound more powerful. So obviously if you're still, if you've got gravitas, if your voice is powerful, if you're using your pauses, they're all kind of high status behaviors. They give people like these nonverbal cues that you have got everything together. You know what you're talking about. You are on top of this. But sometimes it can seem very authoritative. I can't say that word. Um, so some, some situations might demand a bit more kind of approachability. So there are, you know, body language can send such strong signals. So like I said, there are times when those high status kind of behaviors and the ways you can magnify those, you know, holding your head up a bit too high can seem arrogant. Whereas if you tilt it, you're a little bit more approachable. So there might be times when you want to take what you know about that and use it. So definitely, if you want to kind of get people on side and agree with, or kind of be your, be your mates, be, agree with you, support you, a little bit of head tilt can work. Um, this we talked about last week is 
that's something people often do like i don't know if you can see like hands just opening wide is some people often do when they're in a welcoming speech if they're opening an event they're like welcome thank you for coming so the hands open so it's like you're kind of embracing everyone and giving them a, a hug and welcoming welcoming them in so that's a really common one but you can see on the slides there just so many things can kind of take your power away or increase your power i mean the classic power pose is that you know hands behind the head feet up on the desk kind of thing and then the like the exact opposite is like this guy hunched down over here on the bottom and head down so just think about how you can kind of change what people see you as with these nonverbal physical cues it's not all about in fact very little of it is about what's coming out of your mouth people have decided what they think of you within three seconds and that three seconds doesn't involve you speaking it's all physical cues and <clears throat> they're like universally understood physical cues which is why it's so powerful to learn them because once you know what they are and you can use them you don't have to say anything and you're still sending a message and i mean some cultural differences aside most people will get that message without you even opening your mouth so which is why i would spend so much time in these workshops on preparing you and kind of giving you all these tools and then very little on actually preparing your content because once you have all of this stuff kind of in your head and you've practiced it and it's become like muscle memory at a certain stage then you do this on autopilot so once you have the kind of confidence and like technique and vocal technique and breathing technique down like that is what's really worth time putting the time in to practice and actually rehearse that rather than spend hours and hours and hours writing a script laboring over slides i would normally not use slides at all and i'm only using them because i think for a webinar it's just like adds another dimension where we don't have that kind of real life interaction but normally i would just get up get people moving get people up and down <clears throat> and not use the slides because i want people to kind of engage more so if you work on you more than the actual content or the presentation of the content you've got people already it, it almost doesn't matter what you're saying and a lot of the time people will remember one, two, three things from what you've said. So like almost don't worry about what you're going to say <laughs> to a certain extent. Obviously I would say don't ever get up and I'd say get up and speak as much as you can take any opportunity that comes your way, but don't ever get up if you feel like you don't know what you're talking about, because that will crush you. It'll be like falling flat in a comedy club on stage as a comedian and no one laughing or getting heckled. It'll really knock your confidence. So do things you know you can do, do things where you feel comfortable speaking about the subject matter. And it will really build up your confidence. But I'd, I'd say that do it on subjects that you can just talk about without doing, <laughs> doing a fact check on, you know, just get up there and take any opportunity you can definitely. Uh, now, uh, engaging with the audience in a room, it's very different online here, but if you are actually in a meeting, in a conference, in a boardroom, whatever, um, like you need to hold eye contact for an uncomfortable amount of time. Like, and I've done this in workshops where I'm getting people to do it. And I'm like, right now, you have to just speak to that person and look at them directly in the eye for like one, two, three. And both the person doing it and the person on the receiving end of being lit up are cringing. And it, it is really cringy, but you have to practice it and get over that cringe because it feels so uncomfortable and so stupid but it is effective and some people would say hold it for three seconds five seconds some people would say if you lock eyes with someone when you're speaking you finish the point or the paragraph as such and then move on and look at someone else so you might like i mean they're kind of way that you would normally think you would do it is like you just kind of glance at them and then you look at someone else that's way too fast that will end up looking shifty and if you were recorded speaking and i would encourage everyone to record yourselves just to see to see what bad habits you have so that you can work on those if you do really want to improve if you're recorded and you see how fast your eyes move and how shifty it looks and i know mine i, I have a tendency to look around a lot and glance around a lot that 
you really are like, oh my God, I need to like hold my eyes still and myself still so much more. So you would very, do record yourselves if you can. Um, that's kind of hard to do without actually being in a, in a group to do this, but it is a shockingly and surprising and uncomfortable amount of time. So <clears throat> I think to, um, to play this, if you want to play at home, um, what you would do is this game is get people together. If you've anyone at home, like you want to try this out on your family, is everyone raises their hands and then you speak and make eye contact with someone until they lower their hand and they can choose how long they want to leave their hand up for it to make you inwardly cringe or they can count to a certain number if you want to do like a three second or a five second. So just if you have people at home, if you have enough, or even one person at home to do it with, that's a good way to practice that. And it'll make you see how long it has to be. And it's, it's longer than you think. And it's deeply uncomfortable. So I think that is where we're going to leave off last week. So we'll go on to preparing your content. Now, I have more to say about preparing yourself, but it's more about kind of on the day. So actually, we've 20 minutes left. Do you want to do a little poll on do you want to do a little bit on preparing content or do you want to go back straight into what you would do on the day? Because I think maybe on the day might be. Um, hands up for content or hands up for on the day. On the day? Yeah, okay, let's go. Let's skip. Let's <laughs> um, I would say the main point is that it is recommended to use eight words or less on a slide. So um, there you go. <laughs> uh, so I have two parts to this, general practice and specific rehearsal. And if you, like anything, if you want to improve, you do need to just do the heavy lifting yourself at home. So general practice would be using all the techniques and things like that we've learned or the tips and actually recording yourself at home seeing what you need to work on, using the techniques and tips to actually work on that stuff. So that's kind of not, it's not tied to any one event or any one speech or any one presentation. It's just doing a little bit yourself to try and improve things that you want to work on. And then specific rehearsal would be for one particular event or speech or something you have to do. So video and recordings, like everyone has a smartphone, mostly, I think. <laughs> so that's very easily done. Just prop it up somewhere on selfie mode, set it to video, put it somewhere still, or hold it in your hand, whatever, and, and do, do a little practice of some stuff. So these stages that I've listed here are basically the kind of, this is how anyone can learn to be good at this stuff. You don't have to be born with it. So you go from unconsciously incompetent, which is before you video yourself and before you see all the things you're doing wrong, you are doing things wrong, incompetent, and you're unconscious of it because you don't know you're doing it. And we all, everybody has verbal tics or physical tics that we don't notice until we see a video of yourself. And then you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I do that or sound like that or whatever it is. So once you've made the video and you've realized what your tick or your habit is, you are conscious of it. So you're consciously incompetent. So you know that there is something you're doing wrong. Then you practice it and you try and weed it out. So you're consciously competent where you know that you have a bad habit, but you're working on it and you've improved it a lot. So you're getting better at it. And then you've done it so much that it just becomes in, uh, unconsciously competent where you just have it in your muscle memory. It's like learning to drive. You can be on autopilot and all of a sudden it's not there anymore and you can just work away and do your public speaking or your presenting or whatever you need to do and it's gone. You've just worked, you've trained it out and anyone can do that with anything. So if you're doing any recordings, these are the things again, just to recap that you would think about, you would look at your posture, be, you know, stand up straight, level headed. You would work on just using your hands naturally. As we said last week, we have hands attached to our bodies the entire time. They never bother us until we have to stand up in front of other people and speak. And then we're like, what are these things? What do I do with them all of a sudden? Um, focal skills. So there might be specific things about your voice or your projection or any of these that you want to work on or improve. And then the eye contact, which you can make someone in your family seriously uncomfortable practicing with you. Uh, 
this is another good game for the filler words. Now that app that I mentioned is really good, but if you just want a cheap fix at home, is what we do in a workshop is get everyone into pairs, give them two minutes each to talk about whatever, might give them a subject, might just talk about themselves, introduce themselves to each other. And so if I am the, the partner of someone who's talking, every time they say, um, I just go like this or ah, or like, so you're just flagging it to them really visibly when they've said a filler word because they mightn't even notice that they're using them. So you have your two minutes and you count up how many filler words you've got flagged in those two minutes and it can be enlightening. Um, so I'd encourage you to try that, that game at home as well if you, if you want to practice. Um, another few little general practice things that you could be doing at home yourself in the, I mean, if you have something going on, maybe just in the week beforehand, while, it, while it's on your mind, you might try it a little bit every day. It's just to rehearse a little bit and kind of get that muscle memory going. So the vocal warm ups, just try doing those and it'll be loosening out your voice in time. Tongue twisters, like they're all basically to kind of get your, your mouth working to say things better and more fluently with better diction. So like your she sells seashells by the seashore and all those kind of things. And then improv challenges, which I think we touched on last week as well, you know, like doing even just the one word story kind of thing where you get a partner or a group of people and you all just say, go around saying one word of a story and lead on, or then you start two words, three words, four words, five words. So you're just thinking on the spot and you get used to thinking on the spot so that if you do get a difficult question or you do drop your notes and you have to keep going that you're just a little bit more used to speaking without any kind of crutch and remember that we all speak without a script every day and we all manage fine to have conversations so if you do freak out in any kind of situation like that just remember it's a conversation but it's a conversation with more people than you're used to but you're well able to talk we do it all the time um, so if you wanted to try recording yourself and you're wondering what will I speak about to record myself, I would say start with something super, super basic that you know really well. So it could be, I mean, if you wanted to introduce yourself and your business and give a little elevator pitch kind of thing, that could be something you could try just to kind of practice to maybe get yourself ready for that when you're allowed to go to a networking event again, if we're ever allowed out again, could be that. or really simple thing that like most people know or can do or can describe is how to cook an egg. So set a timer or just put your phone on record and give yourself two minutes where you pretend you're hosting a cookery show and you're telling how to boil an egg or scramble an egg or however you want to cook an egg. And just that's a really easy thing because we all know how to do it and we can all describe how we make our breakfast in the morning and just record yourself doing that as something that you should be able to really fluently easily talk about. Um, and then you you know just pick some really easy your first haircut your first car describe it any of those kind of really easy things are good to start doing a video on just to get that practice in and just to see where the points are that you might want to work on so then for a specific practice if you've actually got something coming up that you are kind of rehearsing or practicing for maybe a speech or a presentation i would say again Think about the time that you have to do it. So if you've been told you've got to get up at a conference and talk for 20 minutes, I would definitely set a timer and see, do you take 20 minutes? Because the worst thing is, is standing up and having 10 minutes of stuff prepared and then going, oh, this is awkward. Um, but also, <clears throat> as I'm about to do, running over isn't great either. <laughs> so, I would say try and practice it in varying length. So pretend you've got five minutes. What are the main points that you want to get out? Try and synopsize those. And then pretend that suddenly someone else has dropped out of the conference and you have an extra 10 or 20 minutes. And what would you say then? So that you know your, your actual content really well and you can kind of collapse or expand it depending on what happens. Someone else might have run over someone else might have run short. You might have more or less time than you expect. So just be able to kind of accordion your content a little bit. And it also, it helps you think about what are the key points? What are the things that I really would say if I only had two minutes to say them? Then as well, you know, just in case situations change, it's always good to be prepared. As if you expect to be giving a talk in a tiny room to 10 people and all of a sudden, 
your talk was hugely oversubscribed and 100 people want to come and you're in an auditorium now. It'll be a different experience and it won't be what you've prepared yourself for. So you want to bring a different energy level to that and your energy level is always 10% more than you think you need anyway. <laughs> so a little bit more jazz hands than you were kind of normal, normally in life. So I would say practice kind of just mentally in the mindset of going, okay, so this is how I'd give this information if I'm sitting at a table in a boardroom and this is how I would get, that's kind of campfire, let's say. And then this is how I give this information if I am in a room with a hundred or a thousand people watching me and how I think about projecting my voice that bit more to the back of the room, how I think about asking rhetorical questions because I know no one's actually going to answer because there's a thousand of them in the room, but just to keep them engaged, what kind of rhetorical questions can I ask? Like even just stuff like, are you all still with me? Are you listening? Is, does everyone understand, not are you listening, but like, does everyone understand that last point? And you'll kind of get a, a general murmur of assent or dissent even, but it'll just bring people back into it. So thinking about what kind of potential situations you might end up speaking to, because you don't know in advance. Sometimes at an event it can be not very well attended or better than well attended or better than expected. So just getting used to kind of varying what you might need to bring when you bring it. And then the other thing is if you do have the cue cards, do, do a little shuffle, um, put them in the wrong order and just kind of test yourself with, well, can I jump directly to this topic? If I have to skip a few things, can I skip this, 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 not so important to maybe star the points that are really important that if you kind of are pushed for time, you can just fling a few of them away and get straight to, and you know, you don't have to do them in order. And that's really important because if you just lose your train of thought, you're sunk because that's when you will freeze and then record yourself doing it for checking out how well you did or what you, what you want to work on. With recording, I would always say start well in advance of a specific event because if you only do it the night before and you haven't really practiced up to then, you might freak yourself out and think, oh my God, I'm terrible and I don't have any time to fix this. Start a couple of weeks beforehand if there is something specific coming up so that you can look at it, go, okay, here are things I want to work on. I don't love this, this, this about the way I'm doing this. And you have that time to work on it. Don't like, if, if it's the night before it's too late, you're just gonna give yourself an absolute wobbler. So um, another little thing you can do, like I was saying, if you do have a business or something that you want to kind of promote is practice your elevator pitch. So again, this is something, if we were in a workshop, I'd kind of encourage people to do I don't know if anyone wants to throw themselves into the, the fire <laughs> and actually go a one-liner on, hi, I'm Deanna and I founded the Speaker Club at helping women empower themselves in business and blah, blah, blah. Like that kind of one line, kind of what I do thing. So does anyone want to do it? <laughs> That's a resounding no, I'd say, is it? I can't see everyone at the same time on my little panel here, but I'm not seeing any hands up. <laughs> So look, I'll let you off the hook for now, but when we can do a real life workshop, we're doing a real life workshop and you are all coming and giving me an elevator pitch and I expect you to have it ready. So um, basically introduce yourself. And we talked about introducing yourself slowly with your name to give people a chance to hear it. So it's like Deanna O'Connor, give a little beat between the first and second name. I'm the founder of the Speak Up Club. The Speak Up Club does this. Just very quickly, one line, describe who you are and what you do, because you might only have a second to kind of introduce yourself to someone. You don't want to go into a long and rambling paragraph, especially if it's just kind of a social occasion where going, I do blah, 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 isn't appropriate. Like just a quick, like, oh, I do this and it's great. <laughs> if you can kind of refine that into one line, then introducing yourself will kind of give someone an idea of who you are, what you do, and uh, I'm just getting a chat there. Maggie has offered to give her, give her elevator pitch. Yeah, go on Maggie, <laughs> unmute yourself. <laughs> I thought it might encourage other people. Hey! <laughs> um, so my name is Maggie Breen and I am creativity consultant with Dingle Hope. Excellent. Cool. So that's a very, very good example. Thank you, Maggie. <laughs> um, I, wrote, I won't make everyone do it because I know I'm conscious of time as well. So I do want to fly through the last few slides as well. Um, but yeah, just a very simple little 
just know, know what you say. If you've only a second to impress someone who could make, like, change your life, change your business, be like the person that invests in it or whatever. If you meet them and you have to like, just snappily introduce who you are and what you do, make sure you have that line ready. So on to the next bit, which is on the day. It's like about getting up and getting ready for that event or whatever you have to speak at. So, um, I love this slide. It's like, if you don't want your brain to feel like cauliflower, <laughs> then this is what you should do. I think clothing is always really important and not necessarily, well, obviously to project the image of whoever you want to project the image of, professional or whatever it is. I mean, you'd wear a different thing to go to court than you would if you were being a children's TV presenter. Like you want to wear something very sober, refined, or something very colorful and fun. You want to just think about what, what image you want to project that will go along with what you're trying to present or sell or whatever it is. So the main thing though, when you're speaking is to just have a really, really comfortable outfit on because you just want your whole body to be relaxed. And if you're tense or if you're wearing uncomfortable clothes or you can't breathe in a dress that you're wearing, then it's not going to help. And I don't know if anyone ever read that Marie Kondo book. I think it was Marie Kondo that came out with this anyway. But she recommended um, that when you try clothes on, instead of looking in the mirror in them, just close your eyes and see how they feel on. Because if you buy something because it looks really nice, but it's actually not that comfortable, you'll end up never wearing it or you'll always be uncomfortable when you wear it. So Marie Kondo, her thing is like, just close your eyes, how does it feel? And if it feels really good on, buy it. But if it looks great, but doesn't feel that comfortable, don't buy it. So I would say when you get dressed for a speaking event, close your eyes and see how everything feels. Um, if you're ever going on TV, don't wear any kind of jingly jangly necklaces. I have learned this from experience where I spent a week stressing about what I was going to wear. Finally found the perfect outfit, had this necklace that had like lots of things hanging out of it. And then the sound guy was like, you need to take that off because that's just going to rattle in the microphone. I was just Oh, you don't understand. <laughs> so um, any kind of rattly jewellery, if you're going to, in a position where you're going to be mic'd up, keep the jewellery very um, non-rattly is, is my advice there. And also if you are going to something that you are going to be mic'd up, if it's a mic pack that they have to like actually hook onto something, um, it's good to wear something with a waistband. So maybe separates rather than a dress because you know, it just looks weird if they're trying to stick and, you know, it can be a bit personal trying to stick the mic pack down your dress or up your dress or something like that. So waistbands can be very helpful in that situation. Um, food and drink. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts recently where actually I listened to one called Table Manners, where it's a singer and she interviews people about food and she's always asking them what they eat and drink before they go on stage. Cause obviously as a singer that affects your voice and, um, she had like John Legend on recently talking about how he always, eat, like there's this myth that he used to eat hot, hot buffalo wings before he went on stage and she was dying to know is it true. And so yeah, what you eat can make a difference to your vocal cords. So like I was saying, I was drinking milky coffee, not ideal. So any kind of dairy kind of coats your vocal cords. What singers would say is that the food is important because if you eat too soon before you go on stage, they are worried that they're going to burp on stage. So they wouldn't eat a big heavy meal in the couple of hours just beforehand. Now, obviously people who've really, you know, trained their voice are doing serious diaphragmatic breathing and it, it might be more likely to kind of cause that to happen, but just yourselves, if it's something that you're worried about that you might get a bit of reflux, you know, there's certain foods that you might know cause it, avoid them like the plague and maybe have some, you know, honey and lemon and hot water for your voice if you think that might help. And I know for me, cause I'm sitting down, my breathing isn't as good as it would be if I was doing this talk standing up. So I can feel a bit of like <sighs> happening in my throat already today as well. And so just, yeah, giving your vocal cords a chance to, to last the distance, especially if it's a long talk. Other things are um, environment and technology. So if you can get in there ahead of time and check out where you're going to be speaking, um, you know, is there any kind of outside noise? Is there any bright light shining in on your face at, through a window that'll blind you? 
is there kind of like slides and clickers that you're going to need to use? Can you use them? Does your computer work with what they have? Can you hook it up properly? Is there a microphone? Is there a headset? What, what way is it all going to happen? Um, can you kind of practice with it first? And some people really don't like handheld mics. Some people prefer to be mic'd up with like a Janet Jackson over the ear job. <laughs> I personally hate those and I'd much rather hold a mic because then I can get out from behind a lectern and stand and talk and walk if I want to walk. So all of those things just give you a little bit of sense of control over your surroundings and we all like to feel in control. So in a situation where we're a bit nervous already, it's good to just know the lie of the land and how things are going to run. Another thing to point out is if you are going to be introduced by someone else, if you can talk to them first and make sure they're going to introduce you the way you want to be introduced. Uh, it's always better to get introduced by someone else than kind of go on and start introducing yourself because like everyone's uncomfortable talking about themselves. It's, it takes a lot to get over that. So rather than have to go on and kind of start with your elevator pitch and describe who you are, it's great if someone like Maggie can come on and do it for you. <laughs> so thanks, Maggie. Uh, and you can feed her the lines and tell her to like say nice things about you. And so it's good to do that and just have someone else so that you walk on getting straight into your topic rather than the like, oh, cringe, I have to tell people about myself kind of bit because everybody, like we all hate doing that. Um, then warm up, calm down. So you're warming up your voice, but you're also calming yourself down. And so you can do little warm ups. I mean, go into a, a toilet cubicle and do a bit of stretching, do a bit of like mouth stuff where you're like, mm, with your tongue and ah, yeah, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then also breathing to calm down. And we spoke about the power pose last week, which is the like Wonder Woman pose where you've got your feet wide apart and your hands and your hips and you're like really chest out and even just standing like that deep breathing for a couple of minutes can really kind of make you feel much more confident and poised and ready for it all. And so two more slides and it's nearly 12 o'clock. I actually did quite well. <laughs> uh, so adapting energy to the environment. We kind of already talked about that. So it's like, is it campfire? Is it auditorium? Can you kind of project more or have to make it a bit bigger, like bigger gestures and things like that? And then, yeah, project connecting with your audience. So to make sure that you can project, that you have your mic, that you ask the questions and that you listen. I'm going to skip over this bit, which is all about sitting and then give you the takeaway action plan. Um, and I honestly wouldn't mind hanging on if anybody has any questions. I'm not pushed for time other than that. I have someone walking my dog who <laughs> would be annoying me otherwise. So once they come back, I might have to let him in, but um, sure, he's grand. Um, so I would say if you want to kind of improve, here are the things I would say to do. So number one, record yourself on your phone. Examine your personal style. Think about is it authoritative? Is it friendly? Is it approachable? What do you want to do? I mean, I'm looking at say, Anya, for instance, I know you're in the kind of tourism hospitality sector. You might want to make yourself very approachable, very friendly, as opposed to very like, I'm a powerful speaker, kind of depending on what you want it for. Like you might want to be going on Instagram and doing like, chats and things. and that's definitely a friendlier style. So think about who, what you want to project, who you're talking to, you know, is it, is it welcoming and friendly more so than kind of a very kind of, kind of powerful executive vibe you want to give off, or is it going into meetings with potential investors or like whoever it might be that you have to kind of convince that you're like I know, a bank manager, even, you know, is that like you're looking for a loan? You want to be very like, yes, I'm a very serious business person. I have a serious plan here. So depending on the situation, think about what you want to do. Then just no matter what, try and weed out any ums, ahs, fidgets, um, something like this kind of talking. Work on any kind of little vocal skills, anything like that that you want to practice. Do little rehearsals and if you can, I know like at the moment it's very hard to create any opportunities that are anything to do with being in public, but when things do go back to normal, I'd strongly recommend, even if there isn't a speaking opportunity, like make one, even if it's only going, hey, I can invite all my friends around for dinner. I'm going to make a toast at the end of the meal or the start of the meal and get up and do a little 
two minutes, two lines thing. If that is more than you've ever done before, just do that. It's a great excuse to have a party. Um, yeah, and that is it. So there are all my details if anybody wants to get in touch. Um, I'm going to start, because now that I have makeup on, I'm going to record some videos for the Instagram page. So if anyone wants to give me a follow on Instagram, I'm going to spend my afternoon doing that since I put my face on. And I'm going to do little tips and things for Instagram stories today and then put them out over the next few days. And um, if anybody would like to leave a review, uh, Facebook, where you can do a rating and review on Facebook, I'd really appreciate that. It's great. Um, and that is that. So any questions? <laughs> In general, it would be perceived to be good to speak slowly because, you know, people can actually hear your message and you sound a bit more kind of powerful and in control and it does inspire confidence. So I wouldn't look at it as a bad thing. So yeah, I would say don't, don't change the slowness. That's really good. I mean, I'm constantly trying to make myself talk slower and I, I like today I'm kind of like, oh, I'm just going to let myself away with it because I'm rattling through these slides, trying to get as much of it out yeah. and done for you guys um but i would generally be <laughs> trying to be a lot calmer but uh i'm just excited to see people as well <laughs> like, but like yeah i'd say you kind of have to like try and do that like kind of billy barry kids stage school jazz hands like if it's yeah. a situation where you're trying to do something publicly that you really want to bring it for kind of those purposes that you do have to kind of psych yourself up into it and give it that extra 10% or extra 20% because especially on camera, like from any stuff I've done on TV, I know it's like you think you're being, hey, but actually you're kind of flat. So you have to give it the extra 10, 20% to come across as like normal, enthusiastic on camera. And even okay. if you feel like you're, you're being like a children's TV presenter, kind of, hey kids today, you're not. <laughs> you don't come across that way so you have to not be afraid to to jazz it up a bit um and best way to do that is stand up and smile like a smile like a lunatic like because once you're standing you more energy kind of comes out just naturally anyway yeah and then if you're smiling like even on the phone like if i'm if i'm doing a phone call that i like really don't want to do or like i think like i'm phoning someone like for work purposes that i don't really like <laughs> I always just like plaster on a big fake smile before I, and then like okay <laughs> but your brain actually believes you like your brain believes your body so if you get into the muscle memory habits of doing stuff if you smile it comes out in your voice even if it's a fake smile they can't see that on the phone <laughs> like, you know if you just even watch some comedy or something first something that makes you laugh that puts you in a good mood that like kind of just brings your energy up a little bit and then plaster on a smile and just like really like big smile <laughs> and stand up and even do you know what this sounds really silly but if you stand up and jump up and down with your hands in the air <laughs> it really just kind of lifts your energy because you know when you're sitting down you're just really sluggish and your body like it's just you, know, you don't feel like you feel after a cardio workout put it that way and a really quick fix to just sound and be more energetic is to just like put your hands up in the air and just jump up and down and kind of wiggle around a bit for a minute and it'll just lift all your energy and kind of get your kind of blood moving and stuff like that so I'd say like these sound that sounds so stupid but it really works and then just yeah. like smile and and remember that like what seems like a cringy 10 to 20 percent extra jazz hands to you just comes across it's like yay quite enthusiastic to other people okay like don't just like work um, through the cringe i think is the key okay. <laughs> thank you anybody else oh. guys thanks a million for coming today and especially people who were here before and came back i'm glad it uh you wanted to hear the second part um it was great to do this with you it's been really nice to actually like talk to people <laughs> um, i hope you're all staying well and safe and if anybody wants to get in touch any of those ways that are there please do uh welcome any questions at all um i'm also done this doing this thing that um and it might for some of you it might be good for your, your own businesses or whatever if it works in any way 
it's called one a day and you can look it up on Instagram. So I've committed to anyone who wants a free half hour of like a zoom call. I'll do, I'm happy to do one every day because I just want to talk to people. <laughs> so, um, you know, my, check it out. It might work for you. There might be something you could offer one a day of during this time when we all have a bit more time in our hands. And um, other than that, thanks a million for coming and keep in touch. Maggie, you'll be sending out the slides later. So I was going to send out a more kind of booklet form, but I might not get it done today. There's a lot to go in there, but I will send it out at some point in the future when I have it finished, but we'll send out the slides today anyway, and then I'll send you the booklet on later when it's done. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.